You know, we were just singing that last song, and I'd, I'd never heard that song before, but we sang that line there, here's my heart, Lord, speak truth to me. And uh, I just love that as a prayer, that, Lord, would you speak truth to me? Uh, Jesus said in John chapter 17, sanctify them by your word. Your word is truth. And so God is sanctifying and transforming us by his word. His word is truth. And so it's so great to be able to be here with you this morning to share from the scriptures. As Pastor John said, I, I have the privilege of pastoring a church in North San Diego County. Uh, actually, uh, Pastor Ray Bentley, who some of you know, who's spoken here before, he went to be with the Lord a couple years ago. John came out and did his funeral because they were best friends for many, many years. Uh, Ray was a good friend of mine as well, and his church is just about 20 minutes from my church. So we're right there in North San Diego County. I've been serving there at the church for 25 years this year, and uh, just a real blessing. I started pastoring the church. I took it over from my pastor, Pastor Pastor Pat Kenny back in 2008, so I've been pastoring it for coming into 17 years this next year. My wife and I, we are, we are here in your community this week. We're celebrating, we just celebrated our 18th wedding anniversary, and so we're blessed to be here in Gulf Breeze. Thank you very much. My wife, she came to the first service. Andrea is over here. If you just wave, she's over there. Also with a couple friends of ours who also left California. I can't believe it, but they left California to move to Tennessee, but they knew we were going to be here, so they came to spend some time with us. And you guys live in an awesome place. This is like absolute paradise. In fact, I felt so at home, I wore shorts and sandals. I hope you don't mind to come to church. I mean... This is, the, this is the way that I go to my church in San Diego as well. So uh, as I said, a real blessing to be here. My wife and I, we have four kids. Our oldest, Ethan, is about to turn 16, and we're just getting to that point where we're trying to teach him how to drive so you can pray for us. I'm learning a new kind of faith in driving with my son, and, uh, and I got three more coming after that. So we have a son, Ethan, almost 16, our daughter, Addison, she's 14, and then we have a daughter, Evangeline, who is... 12 going on 13 and actually feels like she's going on 30 some days. And then we have our youngest son, Elliot, is 11. And uh, just real, real blessed to have such a, a great family. And, you know, as a pastor of a church, I'm pretty selective in who I allow to come and speak at my church. And I know that other pastors are like that as well. Pastor Neil is certainly like that. And I knew I was coming down to this area. We have some friends who own a condo down in Destin, and we were going to come and stay in their condo this week. And I sent a text back, I think, in May to Neil, and I said, I'm going to be in your area, and I'm available on the 28th of July to, to teach if you want someone to. And and that's probably like the biggest, most audacious ask that I've ever put to another pastor, because you just don't know. Like, I, I know Neil, but we, we don't know each other really, really well. And he texted right back, and he said, I'd love to have you come out and teach. So I, I counted a real blessing that he would be willing to let me come in and minister to you this morning. I met Neil probably about 10 years ago. We're both involved with church planting within Calvary Chapel, and, and just really amazing to see the work that God has been doing through the movement of Calvary Chapel for a long time. And then I met Pastor John. We both did a conference together in both 2016 and 17 in Ziegen, Germany. And one of the things I have to say about Pastor John, Pastor John oozes cool. <laughs> like, he's just one of those people. I don't know if it's just the air or the water around here or whatever it is, but, like, he just walks around, and he's just, like, cool. And you just go, like, man, this guy is a cool guy. So you got to love Pastor John. Um, in addition to pastoring the church in San Diego, I have the blessing of being a part of another ministry. Maybe you've heard of it, Blue Letter Bible. I'm on the board of a ministry called Blue Letter Bible. If you want to study the Bible, you can just go to blueletterbible.com or .org. Amazing free resources there for you to study through the scriptures. And through that, I'm also connected with another ministry, a board. I'm on the board of Enduring Word with Pastor David Guzik and Commentary. Through those two ministries, God is reaching billions of people. Uh, we, we have billions of page views to both of those websites every single year through the apps that we've developed. And so it, it's amazing to see what God can do through the internet and online. And uh, just great to be a part of that. As I was thinking about what I would share this morning, just looking at what is going on in, in my church, in my area, but not just in my church, in my area, but in our culture, I think you would agree that we are living in a time where there just seems to be a lot of division and disunity and anxiety and worry. And I felt like if, if I could speak to some of those things this morning from the scriptures, that it might be helpful. How, how we might deal with division, disunity, and with anxiety and worry. 
And the Apostle Paul in the New Testament, he wrote a letter to a church that was dealing with those exact things. In fact, many commentators and Bible teachers, when they talk about this passage of Scripture in Philippians, Pastor John already mentioned we'd be in the book of Philippians, they say that it was the division and disunity of some of the members of the church in Philippi that really caused Paul to write this letter. And, and I think that it was the division and disunity that added to the anxiety and the worry. And Paul is writing to this group of Christians trying to encourage and strengthen them in the Lord that they would be sanctified, that they'd be transformed in the way they live their lives. And so that church 2,000 years ago was experiencing division, disunity, anxiety, and worry. And as I look around our culture, but also within the church, we see a lot of division, disunity, anxiety, and worry. I mean, we have the division and disunity, the, the red team versus the blue team, the, the right team versus the left team. We have the, the MSNBC watchers versus the Fox News watchers. We have the subscribers to Pod Save America and the subscribers to the Daily Wire. And so that's like in our culture. But then you get into the church and, and then you've got the, the pre-mill versus the post-mill people. And then you, you've got the people who lean towards God's sovereignty and the people who lean towards man's responsibility. And you have the Calvary Chapel Global Network and you have the Calvary Chapel. So we have all these different things that cause division and disunity and they, they add to anxiety and worry. And, and this is not the way I think that God would desire that we would live. And it wasn't the way that Paul desired that the church at Philippi would be as well. In fact, he, he writes to them in Philippians chapter 2, he says, fulfill my joy by being like-minded. What he's really saying is, it would really make me happy if you didn't fight so much. And if you're a parent this morning of more than one child, you know that sentiment exactly, don't you? It would really make me happy if you didn't fight so much. And there was some issues in the church of Philippi that were causing the church to be divided and there was a lack of unity within the church. And Paul says, I, I would really love it if you could get along. And it is very hard to be happy. It's hard to have joy when there is division and disunity. Every single one of us know that because you've lived through various times in your family, your extended family, where there is division and disunity, and it's hard to have joy, especially if you get together for a family gathering at, you know, whether you're getting together for Thanksgiving or Christmas or whatever it is, if there is division and disunity within the family, you are anxious about that gathering. It is not an enjoyable thing at all. And, and that's exactly what was going on with this church. I mean, the church gathers together as a family, and if there's division and disunity, then there is this feeling of anxious, tense anxiety and worry when you gather together. And that's not the way that Paul would want it to be. That's not the way that Christ would want it to be. Paul says, fulfill my joy by being like-minded, Philippians chapter 2, verse 2, having the same love, being of one accord and of one mind. Paul says, it would really make me happy if you could get along. Now, that might sound like a selfish desire, but really it's a desire for the joy of the whole church. And he wanted that church to walk in joy and rejoicing. And he mentions this theme over and over and over again in the book of Philippians, about joy and rejoicing. And he begins the book with this and he closes the book with this. In the very last chapter in Philippians chapter 4, he says, Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say rejoice. He's battling for their joy. And so he's trying to deal with the division and disunity and the anxiety and the worry in this book, this passage here in Philippians. And Philippians happens to be my favorite book in the Bible. I've read through it many, many times. When I was going through seminary and going studying through Greek, this was the book that we had to translate in our classes for Greek. And so I really got into this book and loved this passage of Scripture. And here's the awesome thing about this joy that Paul is promoting in this book. Joy is contagious, but it is also jealousy-inducing. It's contagious in that when you're around a joyful person, you like to be around a joyful person, and they make you joyful also. But it also is jealousy-inducing, because if somebody else has joy and you don't have it, you want it. And, and you've probably seen this. If you were, have served in the children's ministry, and there's a child in the toddler room playing with a toy and is really joyful over it, there's other people that are going to want that toy to rob their joy. Because they want the joy that that child is getting from that toy, right? I mean, that's exactly the way it works. So joy is jealousy-inducing. And I think God wants you to have the ministry of inducement of jealousy. 
He wants you to have such joy that other people look at you and go, I want that. And, and here's the reason God wants you to have that kind of joy that other people say, I want that. Because that joy is ultimately only found in Christ Jesus. Paul in Galatians chapter 5 says, the fruit of the Spirit is love. What's the second word? Joy. It is the evidence of God's Spirit being in our lives. Joy. And so if you have that joy and other people see it and they want it, that's actually a good thing. And so Paul's desire, I think Christ's desire, my desire certainly is that you would have joy and rejoicing. He wants our joy to be full. Jesus even said that. I would like for you in the Gospel of John for your joy to be full, that my joy would be in you and your joy would be full. And so in the scriptures, in passages like Philippians and in other places, God gives us kind of the algorithm, the steps towards joy. In fact, the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus' longest recorded message in the scriptures, Matthew chapter 5, 6, and 7, is filled with these algorithmic steps towards joy. When you read what are called the Beatitudes in Matthew chapter 5, and it says, blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are those who mourn. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. That word blessed could also be translated, oh, how happy. So Jesus is essentially saying, this is the step to experiencing this kind of joy and happiness. He wants you to have this as a part of your life because joy is contagious and joy is jealousy inducing in others and draws people to you. That's what God wants to do in our lives. However, and you might want to write this down if you're taking notes this morning, disunity, division, worry, anxiety, they're joy killers. They rob us of our joy. They rob the church of joy. And Paul's letter to the Philippians, he presents some antidotes to these things, to disunity and division and to worry and anxiety. And here's the challenge about these antidotes. These antidotes, they seem almost too simple. When, when you see what they are, as Paul writes about them in this letter, they, they almost seem incredible in, in the truest sense of that word, incredible. They seem like they are not credible when he says, this is what is going to deal with division and disunity, or this is what's going to deal with anxiety and worry. When we read them, they're, they're so simple that we can almost skip over them too quickly and not realize the weight of what they are saying because it seems like, no, that just seems too simple. And, and sometimes that's the way antidotes are. You know, just the other day, I had a bout of vertigo. Anybody here ever experienced vertigo before where you just feel totally uh, disoriented and dizzy? I, I've had this problem for a number of years, and it, it flares up from time to time in about Four or five years ago, it flared up, and I finally to the point, you know, I'm one of those guys who, you know, you could have a problem nagging you for like five years, and your wife can tell you the whole time. And my wife, she's a nurse practitioner, so she's in the medical field. So, like, I'll have a headache for like 10 hours, and she'll go, well, did you take anything for it? I'll be like, uh, no. You know? <laughs> so, like, what's your problem? So, so I had this problem with, with uh, vertigo several years ago, and finally I, I came to that point. I was like, all right, I've had this for about three weeks straight. Maybe I should go to the doctor. And I went to the doctor, and they, they did this thing called the Epley Maneuver, which seemed like the most incredible like medical magic. Like Basically, the doctor took my head in hand, had me lay back, and turn my head one side, and roll my body the other side, and turn to the other side, and it went away. And I thought, that is absurd. It seems so simple. It seems incredible that it could possibly work, and it did. And Paul gives us some antidotes to division and disunity and to anxiety and worry, in the book of Philippians that are awesomely helpful. And he says, I want you to fulfill my joy by being united. In Ephesians chapter 4, he says, work really hard to keep the unity of the Spirit. So it, it takes work to do these things, but as we are working these things out by faith, God is working in us to will and to do his good pleasure. That's what Paul says in Philippians chapter 2, verses 12 and 13. Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God who works in you to will and to do his good pleasure. So if we by faith will begin to walk in these things, take the steps to work this out, God will work in us to will and to do his good pleasure, to deal with disunity and division and anxiety and worry, which are joy killers. Because why? Because God wants his joy to be in you and your joy to be full, and then other people are going to see that, and they're going to be jealous of the joy that you have. That's actually a good thing. 
And so I'm very passionate about this because I've seen so much division and disunity, worry and anxiety, especially in the last five years in my church, in my area. I'm sure it's no different here in this area. We see it constantly. And Paul wants us to walk in the fullness of joy. And so he encourages us in this passage of Scripture, and, and we're going to be in Philippians chapter 4, but where we're going to f- primarily focus on the issue of anxiety and worry, but I, I want to take just a quick moment to hit on Paul's remedy for division and disunity. And as I said, it's going to seem so simple that it's almost incredible, but just because it's simple doesn't mean it's easy. It actually takes some work, and that's why we need to work out these things with some effort, knowing that God is working in us to will and to do his good pleasure. But if you have your Bible open to Philippians, look at Philippians chapter 2, opening verses there. Paul says, Therefore, if there is any consolation in Christ, if any comfort of love, if any fellowship of the Spirit, if any affection and mercy, here's what he is asking them to do. Make me happy. Fulfill my joy by being like-minded. How? How can you deal with division and disunity? Fulfill my joy by being like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord and of one mind. How? Verse 3, let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem others better than himself. Let each of you look out not only for your own interests, but also for the interests of others. There's the remedy to disunity and division. It is simple, but it's not easy. It's actually kind of hard to implement. Here's how you deal with division and disunity with that person in this fellowship or in your family where you have division and disunity. Do not look out for your own interests. Don't try to get your own way, but actually look out for their interests and seek to meet their needs. And then Paul, in the remainder of that chapter in chapter 2, he gives a few examples. He gives the example of Jesus who did that for us. He gives the example of a Philippian Christian who came and ministered to him who also did that for Paul. He gives the example of another guy in the New Testament named Timothy who also lived like this, and then Paul in chapter 3 gives himself as an example. So four examples of people who looked out not only for their own needs but for the needs of others. If you have division or disunity with someone in your life and you make it your aim as God is enabling you to do so by his power, he's working in you to will and to do his good pleasure, to look out for their needs and to minister to them and to bless them, that division and disunity will dissolve. It'll go away. Now, it seems utterly simple, so simple that it seems stupid. Like, how can that possibly work? But I guarantee you, if you have division or disunity with someone in your life and you reach out to minister to their needs and to take care of them, it is going to shock them so much. They're going to have a hard time wrapping their mind around. They're going to think you're playing a trick on them. Like, why would you possibly be doing this for me? But I guarantee you, It will deal with the division and disunity. Now, I'm not saying it's easy. It's simple, but it's not easy. Why? Because of this terrible thing that I have and you have as well. It's called the flesh. And the flesh wars against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh. And these two are contrary so that you do not do the things that you desire by the spirit of God to do, Paul says in Galatians. I have the same flesh you have as well. We have this thing that says, I don't want to minister to their needs. They need to deal with this problem that we have. It's their fault. That's always how we think in the flesh. But if I'm seeking to walk in the spirit, walk as Christ walked, well, let me quickly just give you a little bit of Christ's example. He says in verse 5 of Philippians chapter 2, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus who being in the form of God did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bondservant, a servant by choice, and coming in the likeness of men, being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself. He became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. Therefore, God has highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, of those in heaven, those on earth, and those under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of the Father. What an amazing example. Jesus set aside his privilege, his position, his authority. He set aside so much of of who he was and where he was to come and meet and take care of our needs to deal with the division and disunity. Why is it possible for us to connect with God today? Not because of anything we did, but because of what he did and coming down to deal with the problem that was causing the division. He's our example in this. So 
Division and disunity, they are joy killers. But what I really wanted to talk about this morning is this other joy killer, which is anxiety and worry. And and as I talk about this, we're going to look in Philippians chapter 4 at it, but I have a question for you. What is keeping you up at night? And, you know, it may not be one thing. It might be 20 things. It might be all kinds of different things having to do with your family or raising your kids. It might have to do with something at work. It might have to do with an issue with a coworker or a big job that you have coming up. It might have a, uh, to do with some project that you're working on and you can't try, quite figure it out. It might have to do with the political things that are going on in our country. There's a lot of anxiety things that might keep you up at night, and those things rob our joy. And yet Paul... In Philippians chapter 4, verse 4 says, Rejoice in the Lord always again, I say rejoice. That's a command. And and he says it twice to add emphasis. Rejoice in the Lord always. In every circumstance, in every situation, rejoice in the Lord always. Now, how many of you this week fulfilled and followed that command perfectly every single day? For the record, I see no hands raised. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say rejoice. Okay, I I didn't fulfill that command every single day throughout the day this week. None of us did. How many of you would like to live a life where you rejoice in the Lord always? If you're not raising your hand, you're not listening. Pay attention. (laughs) I would love to live a life like that. And aren't you drawn to people who are joyful, full of joy? Yeah, we are. We're drawn to those kind of people. Just like I'm drawn to Pastor John because he's so cool. He just oozes cool. We're drawn to those kind of people who are filled with joy. And and this is a command. Rejoice in the Lord always. There's another command that Paul's going to give here that seems absolutely impossible. He says in verse 5 of Philippians chapter 4, let your gentleness, your kindness, your way of life be known to all men. The Lord at the hand is at hand. And now look at this. Look at this command. Verse 6. Philippians chapter 4, verse 6. Be anxious for nothing. That's a command. Now, if the command was be anxious, we would all fulfill that perfectly. Because <laughs> we're really good at that. But it says be anxious for nothing. Rejoice in the Lord always. Command. Be anxious for nothing. Command. Two commands that seem absolutely impossible for me. Because probably like many of you, I, I wrestle with, struggle with joy. And I certainly find myself up at night worrying about all kinds of different issues, being anxious about all kinds of different things, whether it's with my kids or it's with bills or it's with the church that I pastor or it's with things that are happening in our culture, whatever it may be. I find myself wrestling with those things frequently. But the scriptures say, rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say rejoice and be anxious for nothing. And here's the awesome thing about God's commands. I'm convinced that God never commands anything that he does not also enable. Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who works in you to will and to do his good pleasure. God is working in me and in you by his spirit, by his word, by the body of Christ that he's united us together with to be able to work these things out in our lives. He wants us to walk in his will. And so with his commands, he gives us the enabling power to fulfill those commands. First by his indwelling Holy Spirit, but then also by a roadmap, if you will, through the scriptures on how to implement these things and put them into practice in our lives. So he says, rejoice in the Lord always. You cannot have great joy where you are rejoicing always if there is disunity or division in your life with other people or if there is anxiety and worry. So we have to deal with these things. And Paul gives us the way to deal with those things of division and disunity and following Christ's example and Epaphroditus' example and Timothy's example and Paul's example in chapter 2 and chapter 3. But here he gives this huge exhortation and command, be anxious for nothing. And it's like, okay, but how? That sounds really great. I would like to live a life where I am not anxious about every possible little thing. And we live in a culture that is just constantly filling us with anxiety. I mean, if you have one of these devices, this is like an anxiety producer. 
because of all the stuff that we get fed through social media or text messages or whatever it is, it's just like constantly fanning the flames of anxiety. So how do I deal with this? Well, with his commands, he gives us the enabling power to fulfill these commands. And Paul, when he says, be anxious for nothing, he is echoing a command of Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew chapter 6. In Matthew chapter 6, Jesus commands, do not worry about your life. Well, that's what you worry about all the time. But he says, do not worry about your life. It's a command. And so Paul is only echoing Jesus when he says, be anxious for nothing. How am I going to be able to do that? Well, the Apostle Peter makes very, very clear in his letter, 2 Peter chapter 1, that he says that God, by his divine power, has given us everything that pertains to life and godliness. What that means is God has given you everything by his spirit, through his word, and with the, uni- the body of Christ you're united together with to live this life in a godly manner. He's given it to us. He's given us the enabling power to perform the commands that he gives to us from the scripture. So rejoice in the Lord always. Be anxious for nothing. How? Well, look at what he says. He doesn't finish just with be anxious for nothing. If he left it there, we would be hopeless and helpless. But he says this, be anxious for nothing, Philippians 4 verse 6, but in everything by, what's the word? Prayer. In everything by prayer and supplication, which is a kind of prayer, with thanksgiving, which is a kind of prayer, let your request be made known to God, which is a kind of prayer, and what is the result? The peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds through Christ Jesus. Where does anxiety take place? It takes place in our heart and our minds, something internal to us. Now, we don't know exactly where that conscious part of us is. Ancient peoples would say things like, in the bowels. That's where ancient Hebrews thought that your conscious part of you was. And it's slowly moved up over time, from the bowels to the heart to the head. Like in our culture today, we think that all of our consciousness is just somewhere in our head. Like if there's some little guy inside of our brain that's seeing through our eyes and hearing through our ears and moving everything around. We don't know where it is, but we recognize, every culture has and still does, that there is something internal to us that is aware of everything. And that's the part that wrestles with anxiety and worry. And Paul says, again, it's simple, but it's not easy. Be anxious for nothing. How? And everything by prayer, with thanksgiving, which is prayer, with supplication, which is prayer, letting your request be made known to God, which is prayer. And the result is the peace of God that surpasses all understanding will guard your heart and your mind in Christ Jesus. Now, we know by observation of ourselves and others, and even by medical science, that anxiety is bad. But this is not something new. Even though science has told us that anxiety is linked to headaches and stomach aches and GI problems and breathing problems and pounding hearts and panic attacks and muscle and joint aches and fatigue and increased blood pressure, those are all actual things you'll find on WebMD, because I know when you have some problem, you go to WebMD. Anxiety is linked to all of those things. So do you have some of those things there and many other things that are linked to anxiety? You probably do because we live in the most anxious society in like modern history. And we have these problems. But, you know, the psalmist 3,000 years ago knew that anxiety was a problem that didn't help when he wrote this. Psalm 37, 8. Cease from anger, forsake wrath. Do not fret. It only causes harm. So it's not new. We know that anxiety and worry are bad, but how do we deal with them? Well, Paul makes very, very clear prayer is an essential for our peace. You might want to write that down. Prayer is an essential for our peace. Write it down. Think about it this week. Meditate upon it this week. When you are anxious, prayer is an essential for your peace. It seems simple to the point that it's almost incredible. You mean to tell me that if I just give thanks to God, bring my requests to God, spend time with God in prayer, he's going to deal with my anxiety and my worry? That sounds so incredible that I'm not even going to do it because it's way too, that can't possibly help. And so what happens? Well, we continue going about our life and our days constantly filled with anxiety and worry, and maybe we go to a counselor or a therapist or a doctor, and maybe they prescribe something to deal with the symptoms, 
to deal with the panic attack or the increased heart rate or whatever it might be, the sleepless nights. Here, have some Ambient. Here, have some Xanax. And I'm not speaking against those things necessarily, but maybe there's an underlying cause that if we dealt with this, I might not need that. Maybe you still will. I don't know, but you might relieve the anxiety and the worry if you simply put into practice what God calls us to do. You know, I've tested this in my own life. And you know, sometimes it seems so simple that it's so hard for me to just spend time in prayer because I have too many other things to do. And I think the anxiety and the worry last longer than it needs to sometimes. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer, supplication, and thanksgiving. Let your requests be made known to God and the peace of God. The, the Hebrew word is shalom, the peace of God. The Greek word is irene. The peace of God will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. I need the peace of God to guard my heart and my mind in Christ Jesus. And what I have found is that anxiety and worry are inversely related to prayer, which means the more I pray, the less anxious and worried I am. The less I pray, the more anxious and worried I am. Because when I come to God in prayer... With thanksgiving, I'm giving thanks to God for all the things he's dealt with in the past, the issues, the problems that I faced in the past, and I'm reminded that he actually took care of that thing. And then when I follow that with supplication, saying, God, will you take care of this thing? Then I'm leaving it in his hands and saying, I'm trusting you to take care of it. And so many times I see him work it out in his ways that are far beyond my ways. Prayer is an essential for my peace. And the more I pray, the less anxious I am. The less I pray, the more anxious I am. One great Christian, I believe it was Ian Bounds who said it originally, said, where prayer is focused, power falls. And I would add to that, where prayer is focused, power falls and peace prevails. I've seen it to be true in my life. Now, now Paul begins with prayer, but he does not end there. Look at what he goes on to say, because prayer is one part of the puzzle, if you will, in dealing with this joy killer of anxiety and worry. Philippians chapter 4, verse 6, Be anxious for nothing, but in everything, by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God, and the result, the peace of God that surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. And then this, finally, brethren, my last word on this, whatever things are true, Whatever things are noble, whatever things are just, whatever things are pure, whatever things are lovely, whatever things are of good report, if there is anything virtuous, if there is anything praiseworthy, meditate on these things. Now, this word meditate is a challenge for us because in the last 60 years, a lot of different ideas, primarily Eastern ideas, have come into our culture about meditation And meditation in an Eastern sense, or what is now being labeled as mindfulness, oftentimes involves trying to remove all thought from your mind. But I don't know about you, I've tried this and it's impossible. I don't know how to remove all thought from my mind, because the second I try to, I'm thinking about something else. And immediately I'm thinking about another something else. And then there's like this just stream of thoughts. You know, I would love to try and find a way to get all those thoughts out of my mind, but I don't know how to do it. And sitting in some awkward position and saying, Om, I don't think that's going to help. So that's not meditation in a biblical sense. And, And I think this, I don't remember where I heard it, but I stole it from somebody long ago. And now it's mine because people have quoted me in saying it. I can immediately fix for you what meditation is in a biblical sense. If you know how to worry, you know how to meditate. Because worry is a form of meditation. It's just the wrong kind of meditation. You see, when you are worrying and anxious about something, you are thinking about that thing from every angle, from every distance, up close and far away and all the way around to the point that you know that problem better than anybody has ever known that problem because you have meditated upon that problem over and over and over again. If you know how to worry, you know how to meditate. 
Because meditation, in a biblical sense, is thinking on these things. In fact, another English translation says, think on these things instead of meditate upon these things. So what things ought I to be thinking on? Verse 8 says, if there is anything true and noble and just and pure and lovely and good and virtuous or praiseworthy, think on these things. Paul would say to the Colossians in Colossians chapter 3, set your mind on things above. Jesus, in Matthew chapter 6, when he says, do not worry, he gives us the, the way to deal with anxiety. And he says what? Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things that you worry about will be added unto you. Same exact thing that Paul is saying here. If you are wrestling with anxiety and worry, and most people are, prayer and meditation are essential for your peace. Think on these things that are true and good and lovely and noble and just. Think on these things that are lovely and praiseworthy. Think on these things that are of Christ and his kingdom. Seek first the kingdom of God. And what will be the result? Well, think on those things that are true and noble and just and pure and lovely and good report and virtuous and praiseworthy. And look at verse 9. Meditate on these things the things which you have learned and received and heard and saw in me, you've seen this pattern in my life, these do, and what's the end? The God of peace will be with you. Notice, notice what happened in this text. As you set your mind on things above through prayer, giving thanks to God, bringing your requests to God, your supplications to God, the peace of God will guard your hearts. And as you meditate on these things, the God of peace will draw near to you. The peace of God and the God of peace. And here is my absolute certainty. If you are a person who has joy and rest and a joyless and restless culture, you will be the most popular person in your family, in your workplace, on your school campus, in your neighborhood, wherever you are, people will want to be around you. And they're going to say, how do you get this? And you only have one answer. You're not going to be able to say, well, I bought it on Amazon with Prime. <laughs> That's not the answer. It wasn't some self-help book. It wasn't some medication that you found advertised to you during, you know, whatever news segment you were watching that has some bad side effects. They always have diarrhea as a side effect. It's not that. There's only one answer. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, self-control. Love, joy, peace. Jesus said, come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. That's what he wants to do by his Holy Spirit. He wants us to be those people who are at peace and have joy and love others. And that is about the most evangelistic thing you can do aside from specifically sharing the gospel. Be a man or woman of joy and peace and love and people will be drawn to you just like they were drawn to Christ.